Hi, I'm Jim Cunningham, and we are going to talk about using charitable trusts to save taxes and make the most of your philanthropy. So on a very high level, this is about having less go to the government, right, ultimately, and redirecting those dollars to charity and redirecting them uh, for something other than just handing it over to your state taxing authority and the federal government. So a lot of people are interested in this. And uh, using charitable trust and other ways of giving. So we're going to cover this. So we're going to start with charitable trusts. And then we're going to have um, some people from a charity from 10,000 Degrees, which is great charity. And we'll explain what's going on there to kind of give an example of how charities use money and other ways that people can give to charity in a very tax efficient manner. So, you know, there's kind of two paths. There's a really tax efficient path. And then there's the path that's not as tax efficient, which leaves less for the charity and frankly, less for you at the end of the day. So uh, a lot of people want to make a difference in the world. A lot of people do give to charity. Uh, even people who don't have much give to charity. In fact, the people who are most generous as a percentage of their overall income and wealth are people who have less, right? So it's the people who are wealthier who as a percentage of their wealth uh, many times aren't giving as much as the people who have less. Um, do you want to pay, do you just want to, do you want to make a difference or do you just want to pay the taxes and, and if you help out or pay less tax and if you want to help out charity, that's okay too. We're going to talk about that. And then um, you can have the best of both worlds. So you can help out charity and you can save taxes as well. I'm Jim Cunningham. I'm a partner at Cunningham Legal. I have 30 years experience as an attorney. Our firm has offices throughout the state of California. I'm a certified specialist in estate planning, trust and probate law, a real estate broker, securities and insurance licensed, and a pilot single engine land instrument rated, and a lot of time in a Cherokee 6. A lot of lawyers in our firm helping uh, typically the mass affluent clients with uh, estate planning, real estate needs. Um, getting that wealth from one generation to the next while minimizing taxes. And very important, I'm a lawyer, I'm talking, my lips are moving, words are coming out of my mouth. This is not legal advice. Please do not take it as such. And this is information only. A lot of this is not do it yourself. Um, so really, uh, you want to get qualified advice before you just go out and do stuff. And if you're watching this on YouTube, we're doing this live, but if you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So using charitable trusts, as a tax planning strategy. So what are we talking about here? So what is a charitable trust? A charitable trust, think of it as a bucket, right? So a living trust is a bucket, a charitable trust is a bucket. So there's this bucket and, and that is the charitable trust, that's the document. And then you put assets into this charitable trust. And it's very important to understand, this is what is called a split interest trust. So what does that mean? Well, it means whatever goes into that trust is split into two parts. One part goes to people, right? A lot of times it's a person who gave, you know, if I set up a charitable trust and I put money in that charitable trust or I put stock or something in that trust, I typically get some type of a, of a benefit back, whether it's an income stream or, or something at the end of the term of the trust, I'm getting something back and the charity is getting something back. Very important to understand, a charity only needs to get 10% of what goes into this trust. So it could be 90-10, 90% in favor of me 10% in favor of the charity and still qualify as a charitable trust. Very important for tax deferral purposes. And you can really think of a charitable trust in many instances, it is a tax deferral vehicle. So when we see these used in the real world, a lot of people may have an over-concentration of stock. They might've bought NVIDIA or Apple when it was very low. And they say, look, these are great stocks, but I'm getting a little nervous. I want to I want to diversify my portfolio. How do I do that without incurring a huge capital gain? Well, a lot of people use charitable trusts to do that. And I'm going to walk you through an example to show you that. So these are established for charitable charitable purposes. Uh, again, to at least 10% charity, so not a whole lot. And this is well established under law. This was part of the Tax Act of 1969. So it's been around for a very long time. Uh, even with Elizabeth Warren's plan uh, that's out there that we're going to talk about in a little bit, uh, that's they're, they're not changing the rules on that. So I, I don't think these are really going away anytime soon. These are going to be around for a while. There are varying degrees of tax benefit depending on uh, how the trust is written, right? The terms of the trust and when you contribute that property. And again, what type of assets? So we're going to cover that. Uh, and you can think of a charitable trust, this bucket, right? With a handle and the trustees holding onto the handle. By the way, if you set up a charitable trust, you can be the trustee. So you don't have to have third-party trustee, whether you are the trustee or not. 
probably outside of the scope of what we're talking about here. But really, you've got this trust. It's a bucket. You put assets into the trust. What happens inside of that bucket? That is a tax-free zone, meaning you can sell that NVIDIA stock. You can sell that Apple stock. You can sell that depreciated property. And there is no immediate tax due. In fact, many people get a charitable deduction. So it's kind of flipped. So not only when you sell that property inside of the charitable trust, are you not paying tax at that time? The trust isn't paying the tax. But also the person who's making the donation to that charitable trust gets an immediate tax benefit, even though the charity may not get the money for, for decades, right? They don't get that money, but you as a taxpayer get an upfront charitable deduction. And um, when the money does come out, typically people who make a contribution to a charitable trust, when those dollars do flow out, they are subject to tax, uh, income, capital gains, and net investment income tax. So remember, if that's taxable that's coming out to you, it can push your other uh, income up and push you into that net investment income tax, which is 3.8%. So I know a lot to throw at you, but this is kind of what a charitable trust is. There are two types of charitable trust. There's a charitable remainder trust, meaning the charity gets what's left over at the end of the trust. And there is a charitable lead trust, which means you or your family gets what's left over. So the lead gift is to the charity. So we're going to talk about a charitable remainder trust. And we have three examples. This is where a donor sets up an irrevocable trust. They can transfer cash. We really don't see cash going to a charitable remainder trust. Typically, it's going to be things that have appreciated in value or might appreciate in value. And that's another planning strategy. Um, and the donor receives an income stream or, you know, I can put that this property into a trust and assign that income to my children if I want so I can help them out. Uh, now, it might be a gift, right? That interest might be a gift from me to my children, but I don't have to be the one receiving it. So it's important to note that. And um, there's a minimum 5% payout on a charitable remainder trust and a maximum 50% annual distribution. So that may sound a, a little strange having a 50% distribution from a trust. But again, what we're seeing in the real world is 5, 10, 15%. We might see that, that range and for tax deferral purposes. So there again, there are two types of charitable remainder trusts. There's a charitable remainder unit trust and a charitable remainder annuity trust. Don't get hung up too much on those. We're going we're gonna to talk about those in examples. Just out of the gate, if you have an S-corp and you say, gee, I'd like to sell my company, I want to put my S-corp stock into a charitable trust. You can't do that. You can put pretty much anything in here except S-corp stock. That's kind of a no-go. And we have other tax planning strategies for people with S-corp stock. So here's kind of an infographic. If you're watching this on, on video, the donor transfers highly appreciated assets to a trust and the, the uh, donor gets an income stream uh, from that trust. So let's look at some examples here. So Abel and Baker are 65. Uh, Abel and Baker have a million dollars in appreciated Apple stock. Let's say they bought it for, you know, uh, they bought it a long, long time ago, right? This is actually very common. A lot of our clients have appreciated Apple stock. They create a charitable remainder unit trust. They transfer the shares. The stock is sold. So the trustee of the trust sells the stock and they're able to reallocate their portfolio to a diversified portfolio. I mean, I own Apple stock. I'm not selling it anytime soon. I think it's a great stock. But for these people, for Abel and Baker, they say, well, you know, it's come to an end. This is what we want to do. They get, based on current interest rates, as we're doing this uh, webinar in 2024, they're getting uh, over $330,000 charitable deduction, right? And if they don't use it all in one year, it can be carried forward. So this is actually a really good strategy if you're going to do this, you know, maybe in conjunction with a Roth IRA conversion. So if you have an IRA and you want to convert that to a Roth, sometimes people do a charitable trust that can be used to offset some of the taxes. So this is deducts 332,000 up to 332,000 off your income. Now, the reason I have 30% AGI in here is there are some rules. So if it is appreciated property, you can, you can take a deduction of 30% of your adjusted gross income. If this were cash going in here, it would be 60%. Or if it were basis assets, it would be 60%. A little granular, but just understand, it's not like, you know, if you have 300,000 in income and get a $300,000 deduction, you're not paying any tax. You know, you're only going to get 30% of that. So very important to understand. Again, this is like an A-team thing. So you need your CPA, financial advisor, lawyer, all involved to run the numbers and figure out when and whether uh, Abel and Baker should even be doing this. So um, the, the charitable remainder unit trust pays Abel and Baker 5% annually. That's 50,000 a year. So they're taking the minimum out uh, for the rest of their lives. $50,000 a year. Now, this is great because if they had sold this million dollar stock, they'd be paying, you know, 300 odd thousand dollars in taxes, they would have less assets. So this is going to give them an income stream for the remainder of their life. 
And then whatever's left at the end of Abel and Baker's life goes to charity. It does not go to their children. So that's something I understand. Uh, what some people do is they'll buy a policy of life insurance with maybe that money or part of that money. Maybe they'll buy a million dollar policy of life insurance. So that that's what's called a wealth replacement trust. So these are used in conjunction with a lot of other planning strategies. But um, again, the taxation of income is, is determined on a tiered basis. It is called worst first. So income first, then capital gains then tax-free interest uh, income, then principal. So the principal and tax-free interest is not taxable, but these are taxed uh, sort of differently every year. So there, there's going to be a, a slight variance on, on the nature. You know, if you get a check for 50,000, how that's taxed is likely going to be changing from year to year. So these do require care and feeding. So there is a certain amount of uh, headspace that this is going to fill for Abel and Baker if they choose uh, to go on this path. But this is a great way to take a, an appreciated portfolio and then get an income stream and also a pretty significant income tax deduction. Now, Don, who's single, creates the Don Charitable Trust. He puts a million dollars of NVIDIA stock into the trust. The trustee sells the stock. There's no immediate capital gains. Don gets 50000 a year and he gets 30 payments to age 90. Let's say he dies at 90. He's going to get a million and a half dollars from a million dollars in stock. And whatever's left goes to charity. And Don also receives a slightly higher income tax deduction, okay, even though he's the same age, of 425000 That's because when you look statistically, right, uh, if two people are a beneficiary of a trust, the probability is those payments are going to go on for a longer period of time. So again, it depends on, and the, the whole point of this example is if there's one person or two people, it does affect the amount of the charitable uh, deduction. So it's something important to, to pay attention to. And uh, let's look at a charitable trust as an income smoothing uh, strategy. So uh, Charlie and Delta are 60. And I chose 60 intentionally here because Charlie and Delta retired. So they're not working. They don't have any income. They create a charitable remainder annuity trust with a 10-year term and the charity gets 10% at the end. They put a million dollars appreciated Microsoft stock into the trust the stock is sold at no immediate capital gains, no capital gains taxes paid. They pick up a $234,000 deduction. Without planning, uh, they would have paid $337,000 in tax. That's a lot of money, right? Long-term capital gains tax of $238,000, almost $100,000 in California income tax, plus $28,000 net investment income tax. Now, I'm assuming no other income in this tax year. With the plan they get $100,000 a year for 10 years. So they get their million dollars back, right? Whatever's left goes to charity. And I'm assuming a 4% return. So if it was put into like a fixed income investment, that's getting a 4% return. At the end, the charity is going to get $239,000. They're, they're going to get their million dollars, but they're going to get it over 10 years. But here's the important part. There is no capital gains tax on the first $94,000 in income. There is zero tax if you're married filing jointly. This is why it's important to work with a CPA, financial advisor, and lawyer, because I will tell you, lawyers on their own typically can't figure out if this is appropriate. They need to talk to the financial advisor. They need to talk to the CPA because we need to know, are you going to have any income over the next 10 years? And a lot of people, when they retire at 60, unless they have deferred comp or something else going on, don't have much, if any, income, right? You're retired. You might have savings. You're not yet making your application for Social Security. You're not getting Social Security yet, right? You're not into your required minimum distributions for your retirement accounts. That happens at 73. You know, a lot of people are waiting till 67. I think I'm going to wait till I'm 70 to get Social Security. But this is really important. So if you're at this age of 60 uh, or 65, you could do this over a five-year period, just think about this differently. So the reason I put this up as, uh, as um, an income smoothing strategy is instead of taking all of that capital gains tax hit in one year, you spread it out over 10 years. But when you look at the tax code, there's not a lot of tax being paid. So this is really, uh, a, really a tremendous benefit for this couple. Um, so if they were to sell the stock, so remember this million dollar Microsoft stock and pay the tax, they'd be left with 662,000. If they needed 100,000 a year to live on for six years, uh, they'd get it for six years. In the seventh year, they get 38,000. They wouldn't get any anything in years eight, nine, and 10. So they're actually getting less money. Uh, they'll get about $300,000 less in their pockets. They also won't have the $235,000 charitable deduction, right? So they might be doing this plan in conjunction with a Roth conversion. So converting the IRA to Roth, because remember with a Roth, you pay your taxes up front. There's no minimum distribution when you hit 73. 
The total savings is 338,000 plus 120, which is the value of the deduction, plus the 240 that's going to charity. So on a very high level, if I'm going through the numbers quickly, if you're like, Jim, I don't know what you're talking about. Just get this. With no plan, it's 663,000. With this planning, it's 1,361,000 for the clients and the charity, okay? So this is for Charlie and Delta and the charity. So this is an example of using um, charitable trusts in a way that it does benefit charity, but not much, right? It really is benefiting Charlie and Delta. So a lot of our clients look at this. Um, you know, many are called and, and few are chosen. I will say a lot of people look at charitable trusts and not everyone moves forward with it because they're doing other things. But uh, for many people, this is an effective strategy. So looking at the testamentary charitable reindeer unit trust for an IRA, I do want to just mention this briefly. Instead of leaving your IRA directly to your beneficiaries and understand if you have an IRA, you have not paid, what I'm talking about is not a Roth IRA. You have not paid income tax on this. This is subject to income tax. In California, that's 50%. Those are the marginal rates. It's what it is. These are also subject to death taxes. So if you have a taxable estate, if you're in, in 2024, if you have an estate of over 13 million, if you're single or married in a state of over 26 million, so you have an estate of 30 million and you're married and you have a million dollar IRA, your heirs are going to have to pay 40% on that IRA. And then they're going to have to pay about 53% income tax on that. That's 93% tax on an IRA. I'm not joking. I'm not kidding. Okay. This is real. If you're a wealthy individual, this is a way of stretching out that tax, um, that, that tax bomb, right? Uh, and also, frankly, if you're only getting five, five cents on the dollar, you might want to think about giving, and you have a $30 million estate, you might want to think about giving that million dollars just to charity. And we'll talk about some other ways to do that. So there's a way that you can uh, use charitable planning with IRAs when you pass away, a little bit outside of the scope of what we're talking about here. Uh, charitable lead trust is in, meaning the charity gets the income and the kids, you know, or you get the remainder what's left over. So we see these less than charitable remainder unit trusts. But I did want to mention that the charity gets the lead gift. So the charity is getting the income. And then when that's done, um, whatever's left over goes to the donor or the people who the donor, donor wants it to go to. Um, we're going to open it up for questions here. If you have any questions, go ahead and put those in. Our offices are located in Northern and Southern California. Bay Area, Sacramento region, and LA region. And uh, this is a contact information for 10,000 degrees. I'm going to bring this back up as we do the Q&A so, you, so you've got that information. And uh, the true cost of retiring in California, what you need to know, we're going to cover that September 5th at noon Pacific time. What does it cost to retire in California? A lot of people want to know. Spoiler alert, it's expensive, but it's beautiful. If you can afford it and stay, a lot of people stay, a lot of people go. If you're watching this on YouTube, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're going to open it up for questions. If you are watching this on YouTube, magically, another video is just going to start when this one stops, and it's going to stop right now. So thanks for joining us.